Welcome back everyone, and this time we're going to be looking at the Dev Diary for Nationalist China. By the way, uh, I know that a new one for Kamchai has been released, but I don't care. Uh, since I haven't done the Nationalist China one yet, I'm just going to quick, very quickly go over this. Well, as quickly as possible actually, because there's some things that I need to, well, clear up. So very quickly, this just starts off. You can read all of this by yourself, as always. Now, uh, it starts off with a bit of a history lesson. That's not very good. That's the reason why it's not going to be that short, because I need to actually fill in some gaps. Now, 1946, China was one of the most interesting and confusing countries. I agree. Hold on. This is actually very loud. Okay. After a revolution in 1911, which was called the Shanghai Revolution, and it deposed the last Qing Emperor, Puyi. The Yang Republic quickly found itself ripped apart by a brutal civil war that would continue on and off until 1949. Not true. Uh, I'm going to have to rectify that one. In 1946, the central government under Jiang Jieshu, or Chiang Kai-shek, who is this guy, as you can see in the image, has established some measure of control over the central regions of China. Uh, I'm going to explain why. A number of provisional governors, normally nominally under the control of Jiang, uh, ran their provinces essentially as separate political entities. The communists under Mao Zedong uh, successfully evaded annihilation and created a base area in Yan'an. Uh, yeah, it does not really explain all that much as to why this is. Well, um, let's quickly go over it. Uh, we're going to need a map first. Now, it's a little confusing, this map. Uh, uh, pretty much, uh, it's also a modern one, but pretty much is similar to... Uh, what would have been back then. So the main cities over here are Beijing, uh, Chongqing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. These are the four biggest cities in China today as, uh, well, same as it was yesterday. There's also Tianjin that's pretty important, but Tianjin is basically just uh, Beijing's access to the sea in a way. So this is uh, really, well, there's also Wuhan over here, which is pretty important. Uh, you can ignore Shenzhen over here. This becomes an important city in the 1980s. Anyway, uh, this is China. In 1911, let's quickly go over all of this. 1911, well, actually, I can just uh, do this. So, let's just quickly have a recap. Hold on, if paint will work, it's going to be easier. Oh my god. Anyway, in 1911, we have the Shanghai Revolution, which topples the Qing Dynasty, which was the last government of, uh, well, the last empire of China. So let's. Okay. Oh my god, this is so incredibly small. Like, how about 80? Okay. So, 1911, we have the Shanghai Revolution. Uh, led by a certain dude called Sun Yat-sen. I'm gonna just quickly type all of this down because it's gonna be hard to remember everything because these are Chinese names. People aren't used to them. Sun Yat-sen, uh, also known as Sun Zhongshan, uh, who was also known as Father of the Nation because he was the founder of modern China in a lot of ways. Uh, he fa essentially founded the Chinese Nationalist Party in 1912 to um, attempt to control his new, uh, his new creation, his new modern China. And he called it the KMT, or Guomindang, which means uh, Nation Party or Nationalist Party, as it is often translated. Uh, this was created um, more less as a modern party in what you'd expect Western countries, uh, but more as in an organization that could manage the revolution. Of course, uh, later on, this would be too, kind of changed, and we'll get to that. Unfortunately, he did not have the control over all, neither all of China nor uh, the actual government in Beijing, which fell quickly to the rule of an imperial restorationist called Yuan Shikai, uh, who was actually a military ruler he was a general in the chinese army back then and this starts a trend that we'll see of actual military uh, dictatorships being established and it's going to be important soon eventually uh in 1917 i believe uh, sun yat-sen forms another government down here in southern china in guangzhou which is this city over here also known as canton the central authorities in Beijing eventually fall apart, and all of uh, mainland China, which we are going to understand as, well, mostly this. Let's just quickly 
of course, all of this, all of this, all of this, all of this. Taiwan wasn't in China uh, already. It was part of Japan back then. And let's just quickly imagine it as this. Uh, then we have a few other areas around here, but this is main, mainland China as we're gonna understand it. Of course, we also have Xinjiang over here and Tibet, but Tibet back then was part of a protectorate with the British. Xinjiang was pretty much a no man's land, although it nominally belonged to China. Uh, all of that fell apart from the control of Beijing. And it fell into the control of a lot of warlords, military rulers, who basically uh, set up their own regional slash military entities that controlled various pockets of territory in China. For example, you had military uh, cliques over here, you had one over here, you had some over here, and they'd uh, essentially control regions of China using both their own uh, personal military units over which they had again personal control of they had uh, armies that were poor personally loyal to them as a general because of you know various different reasons and uh we're not gonna go over them and also because of regional uh regionalist type of uh, feelings among the local population that did not want to be controlled by beijing or by Guangzhou, or by uh, Shanghai, which was uh, even back then the economic capital of China, did not want to be controlled by these big cities. They wanted to have autonomy. Uh, so these are the two main forces that uh, sort of get China to be separated. One, warlordism, and two, regionalism. And this means that as we head into the timeline of Hearts of Iron 4, China as a whole is very, very much divided. Uh, it goes through an era of time called the Warlord Era, which, uh, of course, happens because the central authorities in Beijing collapse, and the new uh, revolutionary government in Guangzhou can't really uh, establish control over nothing. Mm, well, it mostly tries to establish control over the Central Plains region over here, but it only really manages to get itself established in the south of China, which would be about this. So from Yunnan over here, this is Yunnan, all the way to, uh, you know, Guan Guangzhou and the sort of southern regions. This is the revolutionary government's extent of control. To uh, unite all of China, uh, as Sun Yat-sen, you know, the remember the revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen, he knew that he had to unite China against foreign aggression because, well, back then we had Japan already. This is, by the way, in around 1918, 1919. Japan was already starting to uh, increase its influence in uh, East Asia. The Germans had just been kicked out of this region. Uh, they had chained out over here the city as a, you know, protectorate. And they have been replaced by the Japanese. So the Japanese had this. And... Sun Yat-sen knew that uh, to make China be truly strong and independent, he needed to throw off the foreign aggressors, and he also needed to unite China, because otherwise, if he had divided his forces, of course, fighting regional battles, he could not win the war for independence. And so, to do this, he enlisted help from the North. Uh, it says Russian Federation here. Just imagine that it is, called, it is just Soviet Union because the Soviet Union had just been established. And in 1923, the Soviets and the Chinese signed a treaty uh, in which the Soviets would provide China with assistance in uh, sort of rebuilding the Chinese army and building a modern state uh, in the name of anti-imperialism, which was the Lenin Doctrine. Because, the, of, course, of course, the revolution had just happened in Russia and, well, Lenin was looking to decrease the influence of Western powers across the globe. So China and its anti-imperialist uh, sort of modern nation-building aspirations was very important to that. So the Soviets sent a lot of assistance to the Guangzhou government, including uh, mostly things like training, expertise, and personnel. Uh, also, material assistance, but I don't know that much about that, so I'm not going to speak about it. Uh, this allowed the Guangzhou government to become the most strong sort of um, 
faction within China. And... Sorry. Uh, what this meant was that they were able to establish a sort of modern republic. However, in 1925, Sun Yat-sen, the great revolutionary leader, died. And at that point, the uh, Guomindang, his party, the Nationalist Party, was split between, well, a few factions. Most, the most important of these were the left KMT under uh, Wang Jinwei and the right under Hu Hanmin. Of course, left being more uh, favorable to an alliance with the Soviets and the right being more favorable to an alliance with the Western powers or and or Japan, although both of these were in sort of um, commonly united in uh, anti-Japanese sentiment, usually. You also had the very important Huampu, sorry, Huampu or Wampoa Military Academy that had been established in uh, Guangzhou, the capital. Sorry. Uh, that was controlled by this guy, Jiang Jieshi, or Chiang Kai-shek. So because of that, he was very strong, a very strong player because he was the commander of the army. You can imagine in a not very well-developed republic, the army would be a very, very important uh, political force. And so once Sun Yat-sen died, he was the one that uh, sort of became the successor without really that much of a uh, political agenda. Unlike Sun Yat-sen, who was a revolutionary and generally had strived for modernization of China uh, so that they could compete with the Western powers, generally uh, Jiang Jieshi wasn't a man of uh, politics. He was more of a military leader. He didn't really have a great... Uh, ideological plan for the development of a modern nation. So he was mostly focused on sort of more traditional values, I guess you could say. He was more conservative. Uh, at the same time, he also had a much more um, developed sense of how to deal with these military warlords that were ravaging throughout China. So uh, what he does is in 1927, he prepares for what was called the Northern Expedition, which was, of course, they only had this. So they had to expand into the rest of China and united by force. This was called, again, the Northern Expedition because we're, they were going north. However, at this time, Jiang Jieshi, who was, again, more conservative, had decided to break with what was called the First United Front, uh, which was the alliance between the... Uh, the Guomindang, the Nationalist Party, and the growing Communist Party, or Gongchandang, uh, who had just been established in around 1923 as a sort of sister party to the KMT under uh, those treaties that we had talked about with the Soviet Union. So at that point, what was called the First United Front, aka the collab collaboration between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party, broke apart because in going north, which happened relatively swiftly, Jiang Jieshi eventually started to become a little bit too powerful. And he was started to worry about not only the communist influence in, um, in the Nationalist Party, but also about the influence of the left wing of the Guomindang. If you remember, the Guomindang had a left wing and a right wing, and a lot of regional cliques as well that uh, sort of had their own influences and factions within the party. So it wasn't the united party as we think of today, which is why that's kind of important. And eventually, why did the music stop? Anyway, uh, eventually the forces of the Guomindang reached Shanghai and there they massacred uh, basically the entire communist leadership that was uh, present there and it, it, Shanghai was the city where the communists were the strongest because it was the most industrialized. Uh, that caused a slight bit of rift of course with the communists who decided that well maybe the first united front wasn't such a good idea. They also initiated their own uprisings in the south the most important of which being the Nanchang uprising but also other uh, cities were occupied very briefly and then eventually they established right about over here a zone under their control. But that's going to be a story for later. <coughs> uh, 
Also, the left wing of the Kuomintang was not very happy about all of this. They set up a separate government in Wuhan, which is this city over here, uh, which kind of declared that Jiang Jiexie was illegitimate. At this point, what he decided to do was crush them, which he did, and he continued uh, north, eventually uh, nominally liberating Beijing, but really Beijing was not under his control, it was the, under the control of the warlord. So at this, at this point in 1927, you have at least a nominal unification of um, basically all of China from Manchuria all the way over here, all the way to uh, Vietnam, Kunming and Guangzhou under the KMT, although most of the space was actually controlled by local and regional warlords who vied for influence and power and was, were often bribed by one side or another in local struggles, and they were often bribed also by the Japanese. Uh, and in 1931, as you all know, the Japanese from Korea, which was back then uh, their territory, they invaded Manchuria and took that. So at this point, China has left in the situation which it is in in 1936, nominally under the control of basically this, but really only having uh, an area of influence that stretches from, uh, well, about this. Okay. At some point, you remember the first, and this is actually where the, you know, developers kind of screwed up. They called the Chinese Civil War from 1911 to 1949, whereas in reality, the Chinese Civil War really starts with the Nanchang Uprising in 1927 and with the Shanghai Massacre. So it is these two events from 1927 to 1949 that ignite the uh, Chinese Civil War. So it starts with the uh, Nanchang Uprising and the Northern Expedition indirectly. Eventually, the communists were forced out of their uh, sort of base bases in Jiangxi, uh, etc, etc, and their strongholds in the south. They had the long march, and they eventually ran all the way to uh, up here to Xi'an and Yan'an. And here they made their sort of stronghold, also Taiyuan. So uh, Taiyuan was actually under the control of Warlord. So they had this area under their control, which is what you normally see them in uh, Hearts of Iron 4. And eventually they were sent over that way. So that is the political situation very quickly. Uh, yeah, that was very quickly. I should have had a lot more things. Well, I had a lot more things to talk about, but there was no time. Anyway, uh, this focus tree overall is quite good. I like it. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly go over it and uh, end this dev diary review, but just gonna also quickly explain a few of these, what they mean. So on the left side is the political stuff. You have the free principles of the people, welfare, democracy, and nationalism. The translation of the free principles of the people is, eh. uh, the free principles were the main doctrine, the main political principles of uh, Sun Yat-sen, the great revolutionary who had, you know, overthrown the Qing. And those three principles, well, democracy, yeah, the people's rule, pretty much democracy. Nationalism, uh, um, kinda, uh, really more means the nation's well-being. And welfare, it's more like the people's well-being. Some people also translate that as socialism, even. Uh, all very, very uh, foggy terrain, not gonna go into it. Anyway, uh, down here on the left-hand side, you can see... You get the welfare tree, uh, which also includes something called the New Life Movement. Now, the New Life Movement, I don't think is going to be represented well. It was actually a massive propaganda campaign started by Jiang Jiexie, uh, the Generalissimo, to increase his political control over the country and over the sort of right wings of the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party. And they promoted life according to, like, a set of rules that were based on like the f four main Confucian virtues and well not really the four main Confucian virtues but something of the sort don't really remember exactly how it was but yeah that's basically what it was however um, by 1936 it was already over it would have been kind of a failure so uh, I don't know uh, 
democracy, you get the constitutional reform, and you get the very unique um, legislative structure, or sorry, not, not uh, legislative, executive sort of uh, divisions of the Republic of China, which, by the way, are still standing in Taiwan, uh, also known as the Republic of China. So you have the five yuan, uh, who are the branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial, exactly what you'd expect from Western countries. Then you also have the control and examination yuan, which are, well, the control yuan is more like a commission that controls all the other, uh, that, that all the other um, branches aren't stepping out of their boundaries. So it's more like an even more uh, focused judicial branch. And then you have the examination yuan, which is actually a evolution of the imperial examination systems of um, the Chinese Empire. So it's uh, it has to deal with how you employ uh, government officials and uh, um, civil servants, all that stuff. You have the nationalism branch, which is focused on fighting Japan. And here you actually have another important thing. Sorry. You have another important thing, which is uh, that in the nationalism branch, you can either go with prioritizing the interior or foreign threats. Now, uh, I hope that if you prioritize the interior, you're going to get an event called the CN Incident. Oh, damn. I think I actually clicked away that map of China. Rip. Anyway, uh, so the CN Incident is what ended up happening historically. Uh, so a general was actually convinced to kidnap Jiang Jiexie, the leader, and send him over to the communists in exchange of, well, uh, he's going to sign... Well, he would be released if he signed a treaty uh, calling for the creation of a second united front uh, with the communist party against the Japanese. If not, he would he would have just, you know, kept him arrested or something he would have taken over the government and yeah uh, because he felt like there was being too much effort being wasted on infighting between the various japanese or chinese sorry uh factions and that's basically why the communists survive all the way up to the um to the actual war with japan which is about a year after the cn incidents something like that so that general Plus one, he, he knew what was going on. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the second United Front, of course, against Japan, and then you get all of that uh, pretty normal stuff. You even get the Dare to Die Corps, which is essentially a suicide unit, or, or we're a bunch of suicide, or I guess you could say in Western terms it would be a forlorn hope unit. And then I wonder where that war of anti-imperialism is. I wonder if it gives you a... Uh, gives you like a way to end the war with Japan or trying to continue it all the way to the Japanese mainland once you've kicked them out of Korea and China of course then there's a very tiny uh, military tree uh, the reason it's so tiny is that there's as you can see already some of that on the left hand side with the free principles of the people and then there's some more over here on the right when you uh, get a lot of foreign foreign advisors and foreign assistants a lot of good stuff for your army in that way so that's why the military tree is so small but what's interesting is that there is the Wampo military academy also known as Huampu um, which had already been established in like 1924 or something so I'm not sure what it's doing over there but I'm guessing it's they could have just said expand the Wampo academy another interesting thing over there would be the 60 division plan which was actually uh Initiated by, let me uh, let's quickly go, by a guy called Hans von Zicht, who was actually the uh, chief of staff of the Reichswehr right after the end of World War I and the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles. So he was the leader of the Army of the Weimar Republic, and very interesting character on his own uh, would make a video. Uh, he basically created the German army and then almost created the Chinese army as well with the 60 division plan that was supposed to have 60 army divisions armed and trained in the German way 
rather than uh, the kind of uh, ephemeral patchwork of uh, warlord troops and uh, military divisions that the Republic of China had at the time. Because of course, after the uh, after the big northern expedition, the sort of discipline, the modern army that had been created under the guidance of Jiang Jiexi, uh and under the guidance of the Huan Pu Military Academy and the Soviet advisors uh, kind of got reintegrated into that whole system of regional allegiances and uh, warlords that plagued China at the time. Because technically, by that point, uh, the KMT had the government of all of China. Then you have a small industry tree. Nothing really too strange. Uh, looks like you also have some ways of dealing with your uh, foreign debt. And then you have the most important and I think interesting part of this focus tree, which is the foreign investors and foreign advisors. Uh, so you have some uh, interesting stuff, which is the fact that you can choose between these the various countries. So you can either have the Soviets or the Germans, the French or the British, and the US or the Japanese. That's what I like. Uh, also, interestingly enough, you can get the Flying Tigers, so I wonder if you're going to be able to have your own little uh, your own little illegal Air Force. It's going to be great. Uh, yeah. The reason why it says reapproachment with the Soviet Union over there under, under the mission with the Soviet Union is because, again, in 1927, the nationalists kind of broke with the communists. And even though back then, of course, you already had a different government in charge of the Soviet Union. You already had a power struggle between Leon Trotsky's internationalists and uh, Stalin's sort of uh, socialism in one uh, country doctrine. And this actual event of the, the split between the Communist Party in China and the Nationalist Party was actually kind of inserted into that power struggle. So you had some members of uh, the Soviet Communist Party that were in favor of just breaking with China over the massacre of the communists. And then you had another faction that was in favor of just continuing the support of China. Uh, and it kind of ties into all of that. However, there was also... Um, it's also kind of interesting with the mission to Germany because Germany did have a lot of advisors in China in the 1920s and 30s, uh, which is also the reason why you had uh, Hans von Zicht devise the 60 Division Plan because the actual uh, German support to China was increasing under the government of Adolf Hitler. So... Uh, it was actually kind of a, a reason to increase German influence in China that way. And yeah, uh, it makes sense to go down that line. You also get the Chinese Panzers. Uh, the Chinese, if I recall correctly, did have Panzer 1s and Panzer 2s shipped by Germany. Although at one point, the Germans kind of stopped sending them there, sending them help because, well, the Japanese just kind of told them to shut up and stop doing that. And then at the end, once you finish all of this, you uh, can renegotiate the unequal treaties. I believe you only need one of those to be completed, because that's a you know that's a dotted line. So I think you're only going to need one or either two, something like that, of those focuses finished to go down that foreign policy line. And that kind of represents, um, I think. Hold on. That kind of represents like how uh, first you need to strengthen your internal position and then you're going to be able to take on uh, the unequal treaties, which are, of course, the treaties between the Western powers and China that were signed usually before World War I and before the revolution, but also a few after. And yeah, you all already have all of that. So like, you know, just conquer everybody, etc., etc. Just normal. And then you have the explanation of all of this, of course. Uh, you do have some you have some interesting decisions about like the Burma Road, which are which is represented by Opf map factories. So that is how you represent like the British shipping in some uh, equipment to you. As long as, of course, both sides maintain control over the border crossings in Burma. 
And yeah, pretty much uh, pretty much nothing too strange. There's new models, etc. So I think uh, there's also Alexander from Falkenhausen, as you can see over there. What I think about the focus tree is that it's pretty good. Uh, there's some issues, but it's all right. And I think it's going to be pretty fun to play, especially. I mean, uh, the foreign stuff part is going to be very, very cool. And, well, the lackluster... The lackluster, you know, parts on the other side are... It's okay. Uh, overall, considering how good some mods are, though, I mean, I feel like they could have done better. Still... I want to thank y'all for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. Sorry for the introduction part, although I feel like that's like really the reason why you'd want to watch this video. Um, if you thought it bore, it was boring, then I oh, well, sorry, just dislike it, <laughs> dislike the video. If you, in the, uh, on the other hand, did like the introduction, well, uh, you can like the video, and then I'll know that more of this stuff is good. Just explaining why stuff in Hearts of Iron is the way it is. Yeah, thank you for watching. Hope you have enjoyed. I'll see you soon. Have a nice day.